But yeah, here we are. So thank you anyway. Thanks again for your patience. Um, good start. It is my great honor to introduce my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Annie Finch. Dr. Finch is a long-standing member of the Westchester University poetry community. Last week, when my colleague, Luann Smith, moved out of her office, she handed me a framed, signed poster from the first or second year of the gathering that would evolve over two and a half decades to become the Westchester Poetry Center. Then, in 1995 or 96, it was the Westchester Summer Poetry Reading Series, not even a conference. The featured reader was the esteemed poet Donald Justice. Annie Finch was among one of the, the list of luminaries who signed that poster. Um, and that's an amazing thing that we have, an amazing artifact. Through her storied career as an award-winning poet, critic, and teacher, among her many talents and pursuits, Dr. Finch has remained dedicated, dedicated to reinvigorating our interest in and awareness of meter and form. Dr. Annie Finch's seven books of poetry include Eve, Calendars, Among the Goddesses, New and Selected, um, Among the Goddesses, Spells, New and Selected Poems, all published by Wesleyan University Press. Annie's poetry has appeared in Poetry, Paris Review, New York Times, and the Penguin Book of 20th Century American Poetry. Her books about poetry include The Body of Poetry and A Poet's Craft, A Comprehensive Guide to Making and Sharing Your Poetry. Annie holds a PhD from Stanford and teaches online classes on poetry at AnnieFinch.com and in the Poetry Witch community. She's passionate about helping to bring the pleasure and power of rhythm and meter back into poetry. As her brief biography suggests, Annie Finch's work in life is deeply engaged in the complexities of craft. For Finch, craft, both poetic and Wiccan, is rooted in the rhythms and textures of language. As Joy Har Harjo argues in her review of spells, quote, Annie Finch's spells is a pure tone that calls us home to the first impulse of poetry. We link to mystery, we lift off. Finch's work is transformative. She knows exactly how to create verse that prompts us to engage with the world, the power of nature, the magic of our own being, our bodies, our energy, and the energies that surround us. On poets.org, the essayist argues, quote, uniting all of Finch's work is a conception of poetry as essentially incantatory, performative, speaking to the body as much as to the world, as much as to the mind. The themes of Finch's poems draw upon earth-centered spirituality, myth, sex, and childbirth. A practicing Wiccan, her poetry is inspired largely by her relationship with the natural world, especially the landscapes of Maine. There is no better time to embrace the transformative power of poetry than now, and there is no better teacher than Dr. Annie Finch. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Finch. Down the Celtic Halloween. In the season, leaves should love, since it gives them leave to move through the wind toward the ground they were watching while they hung. Legend says there is a seam stitching darkness like a meme. Now, when dying grasses veil earth from the sky in one last pale wave, 
and autumn dies to bring winter back and then the spring. We who die ourselves can peel back another kind of veil that hangs among us like thick smoke. Tonight, at last, we feel it shake. We feel the nights stretching away, thousands long behind the days, till they reach the darkness where all of us is ancestors. I move my hand and feel a touch move with me. And when I brush my young mind across another, I am with my mother's mother. Sure as footsteps in my waiting self, I find her. And she brings arms that have answers for me. Intimate, awaiting bounty. Carry me. She leaves that trail through the shutter in the veil and leaves like amber where she stays, a gift for her perpetual gaze. The wheel of the year. Turn me, touch me, move me, change me, seasons of the turning year. Heal me, make me, rearrange me, lead me home again here. Turn them, touch them, move them, make them. Seasons of the turning year, heal them, move them, rearrange them, lead them home again here. Turn us, change us, move us, make us seasons of the turning year. Heal us, move us, rearrange us. Lead us home again here. at Robert Frost's grave. I think of your quiet grave now and again, when innocence has called me out of sleep, close to my husband's side, to lean again against his breathing human side, to keep myself breathed in his liquid human breath. I think of your nurturing grave so often. Death has made you a place I like to imagine going. Opening the gate to your grave, entering in, reaping your silence where a small tree, growing generous in the forgiveness of your sin, leans over your stone. The grass, your bones, the grass, the grass, 
the grass. I like to imagine frost there, hung like frost on a beach in November, when the sun rises on winter, just as it rose on spring, on the humid decision to grow past everything. Zaraf Star for my sister, Dabney Finch, born 1952, died 2018. Walking changes as dusk starts to gather. We're not able or sure anymore. We don't know the path, and if we did know it, we wouldn't go on. We're afraid of the dark, lowering its heavy, long familiarity down on the grass. We're afraid of the night, moonless desert, California, making us stumble. We shouldn't be lost out here like demons, just at the border that touches us solid as if we were gone. She's leading me on a path as narrow as sisters can share, we pound back down the mesa. Each of our feet finds its own way, delving into the gullies whose trees never answer until, with steps slapping soft as bandits, I slow on the path, imagining horses. Stretching necks right out of the stones, out of the dusk where dark has achieved our bodies, drawn by the strides that my sister takes like a rider. Zaraf star, Fashad, Kashmir, Arabian horses raise her up with motionless shadows so she can ride. Like a rider, she walks, cantering, encompassing the pace of the mountain. Out in a landscape to curl or be curled in, hunched like riders or curling like rides under the fairy tale oaks of the mesa that hide sleeping children or horses inside. We talk about horses like hers who run carefully with thinner ankles and mustangs who fast. Wild girl, wild on the path to darkness, hunger like stars reaching down for dark leaves. And this is an owl poem. You see, I have my owl right here. To me, it's the bird of poetry. And there's an owl called a spectral owl. Spectral owl, who, who knew you would grow from gray bark? so that nothing is separate or new but your yellow eyes following through from the mottling brown in the dark spectral owl, from the spiral, the spark that your circling feathers lead to. Who, who knew she would speak as we do Great gray ghost who knew you could speak. Thank you. 
Here's a poem about COVID-19. Masks, flowers, garlic. Death is also a woman who plows the fields. A quote from Jennifer Goldwasser. Masks, flowers, garlic. More hands are washed, breath held, a wedding band is twisted. Someone's voice will carry low, then find itself at last alone and slow with the unfinished. What is left to plan? We sing, we clean, reach out as best we can, plowing our days towards mercy or the blow. Masks, flowers, garlic will be ours to show when she who comes to stalk with opened hands, whispering, hold it close or let it go, unfurls the reaping there is left to sow. I edited this book, Choice Words, Writers on Abortion, because there was no such book in the world. There was no collection of literature about abortion. And you might think that people hadn't written about it. Not true. <laughs> it took some finding, but there was a lot. And this is my poem from this book. An abortion day spell for two voices. As I turn your blood back to the earth, I am life, you are death. And we kiss through the fire that is my freedom's birth. By the womb of our love's endlessness, as you turn my blood back to the earth, I am death, you are life, and we kiss as we move through the deep, giving forth to the web that is love woven bliss by the fire that is our freedom's birth. As I turn your blood back to the earth, I am life, you are death, and we kiss in the fire that is my freedom's birth. By the womb of our love's endlessness, as you turn my blood back to the earth, I am death, you are life, and we kiss as we move through the deep, giving forth to the web that is love woven bliss by the fire that is our freedom's birth. As I turn your blood back to the earth, I am life, you are death, and we kiss in the fire that is my freedom's birth. By the womb of our love's endlessness, as you turn my blood back to the earth, I am death, you are life, and we kiss as we move through the deep, giving forth to the web that is love-woven bliss by the fire that is our freedom's birth. I always read my spells three times. It makes them more powerful. This book, Spells, has some poems called The Lost Poems. They're poems that I wrote in the 1980s before it was
common to write in meter, which has really become more popular again since then. And they were experimental poems. They were in meter, and I kept them in a drawer for 20 years until other people began writing experimental poems in meter. So there are 40 of them in this book. I call them the lost poems. And this is by request to Dear Cat. This is called A Wreath of Time, dedicated to Anne Bradstreet, an early poem, poet of the US. Bursting with fruit, my lips have opened time to duck into your valley, not behind the walls of silence. I am not the line you need to walk on or that you need to see, and I am in your heart. Courage for me extends out to your hands. Your fingers see. Another lost poem, She That. The source of night is madness. I am she who knows the way of madness. I am found on edges of high cascades. I be one on the edge of nutrients. Free me and all the vanished kind find tapestry. This book is arranged backwards. It has the new poems at the beginning, and as you read through, you go back decade by decade. So it goes from 2000 to 1990, and then it goes from 1990 to 1980, and then it goes from 1979 to 1970, and you go backwards. And I'm gonna read you now a few of the poems that I wrote that are some of the earliest poems in this book that I actually wrote when I was in college and I was first learning how to write in meter and form. And there is one called A Dusk Song. Over the big bed in the small room, the flat shadow turned thinning our walls insistently, turning and turning us closer and closer to salt wind in from the sea. I could sing a song about a long gone lover, Cape Cod dusk, Cape Cod shadow. I sang a song then about the Cape Cod shadow over door and wall, over shoulder and shoulder. Did I have a face, and did it lie in shadow, turning and turning your glances away? Once there was a song about the Cape Cod shadow. I sang the song. The flat shadow turned over our walls and brought the sea in. The song kept turning. And this one was a poem that at the time, I was an undergraduate, I didn't realize it was about being molested as a child by my uncle. I had no idea what it was about. I thought it was a poem about the myth of Apollo and Daphne, which is of course a myth about someone being molested by someone way more powerful than they are. So if you remember the story, Daphne was a nymph, and her father was the river god Pentheus, and Apollo fell in love with her, meaning he wanted to molest her, and he ran after her and chased her through the woods, and she was trying to get away from him, and she couldn't, and so she prayed to her father, and her father turned her into a tree so she could get away from him. And this is this 
poem I wrote about the Smith, When Daphne Ran. When Daphne ran, leaving the god to stand, holding his useless arrows in his hand, to stand, to run, and reach the forming tree just quickly enough to watch and touch, the last dissolving into wood of the now steadfast and rooted flesh. Did she mean to flee really away from his huge and glorious hand, leaving him really baffled and shining to stand? She had hated how he kicked his way through the wood, knowing a few of his low singing words would seduce her, calling his lust, letting his love loose on her, big and imperious, crowding the trembling wood, till she suddenly ran and he stopped for a second to stand. The wood was still. He stared at his trembling hand. She, still in the night, long after the god has gone, taking his tears, his lyre, his laurel wreath, she, her mind growing vague already beneath the layers of bark, vaguely remembering dawn, vaguely remembers. By dawn, she'll forget the bright hand and the last way he touched her before he left her to stand. So that was a myth that I wrote about, again, several times, still without really understanding, I think, why I wanted to write about it until I got a lot older and through lots of body work and other kinds of therapy, but especially body work, I discovered the hidden memories in my body of that experience. And I have a recent poem on the same subject. This is my new book that I'm just finishing called Spiral Brave Women's Amulet. And those who were there today in my craft talk know that meter is very important to me. And this, this book is written in five different meters. So I spent like, I spent another eight years working on it after it was already finished when I realized I really need to turn this book into five different meters if, if I believe what I teach about metrical diversity and the power of the different meters, I really need to show it in this book because there aren't that many poems in a lot of these meters as we talked about today. I don't think the Tamil is so dominant. So I did, I turned this book into that. And there's a poem in here on that same topic of Apollo and Daphne. It's based on a statue in Rome that I saw by Bernini where it shows Apollo, uh, Daphne just in the middle of turning into a tree. And Apollo is right there next to her looking. Well, it's called Stone Apollo, Stone Daphne. His stone nose on the hunt, her stone mouth like a wound. Through the gas on her face, pour the leaves as they turn the truth over and over. His stone hand like an arrow through hers like a tree. Her cold mouth all agape with the stone that remembers it over and over. His stone hair like the wind, her stone hair like warm blood as the pain on her face roots in bright, bright, bright leaves where she blooms again over and over. And once I became more conscious of what had happened to me, I wrote another poem about it that there's an essay, actually, that's going to be coming out uh, soon in, in a book about the process of writing this poem and how it took 12 years to write it. 
And it didn't really get finished until I discovered a form called the Villanelle form. As some of you know, I'm going to be judging the Iris Spencer Award next uh, spring, February, is the deadline. And it's for formal poetry and is named in honor of the mother of our friend Keen. Um, it's really an honor to be judging this award. I'm, I'm very happy about it because it gives undergraduates from all around a chance to write poems in form and um, have them uh, sent to this contest. And ins I hope will inspire people to experience the transformative power of form and meter over language. And in this, sometimes when you find the right form, suddenly the poem is released. It's been waiting, and that's what happened with this poem. It was not a Villanelle for probably about seven or eight years. And then when I finally realized that it should be a Villanelle, that's when I began to get closer to finishing the poem. And as you'll learn when you start working more with form, those of you who do, you'll discover that one of the amazing things about form is that it's by messing with it that you really respect it. That you know, you, you need to make it your own in whatever way the poem demands. In this case, you'll hear, if you know the Villanelle, that the first line and the third line are supposed to rhyme. But in this poem, they're not just rhyming, they're the same word repeated over and over, so you'll hear that. It's called a root. What happened when he grabbed me at the root? I stopped. It all stopped. Spirals fought to win my spiral life from an unspiraled root. From thick cigar stubbed in my young tongue's root, heart beating uncle lifetimes through my skin. What happened when he grabbed me at the root where women learn to starve our open root? One broken body. One more, broken in. One spiral life from an unspiraled root lord pomegranate. In the basement, root torn hell of seed, as if seed might have been what happened. When he grabbed me at the root, did ancestors throw chains down through our root to rot and winnow? with their pain and sin, my spiral life from an unspiraled root. Oh, sisters, keen our sisters, till the root of loving turns, and not from twisted kin. What happened when he grabbed me at the root? Our spiral life from an unspiraled root. Brave Women's Amulet. Women have voices it's time to believe in. Brave women's words spoken out, clear and steady, move us with generous ways of achieving. Women have voices it's time to believe in, braiding sweet worlds. This brave, loving weaving is singing our lives back, and women are ready. Women have voices. It's time to believe in brave women's words, spoken out, clear, and steady. Sojourner, this one for Sojourner Truth. Out from the mask, cheek and tear, center the center could wear, five enforced children who bore love in the bonds, 
bound bonds care, fist through an unfurling core, freedom's new heart forced to bear, ancestor bound beating sphere, honor your mouth, from which tore cowardly shells, treasure and clear. Witches. Witches shall believe in earth, birth in body, darker birth. Power above, power below, witches shall find high and low, earth and rock and depth of sand, power grows everywhere she stands. Birth in spirit, center, love, witches shall believe and move. Power before and power after. Witches shall believe in laughter. So I was very lucky to work with the great poet Entezaki Shange uh, when I was in graduate school. And Zaki meant so much to me. She believed in me completely at a time when I felt that it was not clear whether anybody ever would. And she was just amazing. And I didn't see her again. I tried to get back in touch with her. She's internationally famous. She uh, was an amazing playwright, novelist, poet, dancer, activist. Uh, just an, an amazing force, and I couldn't get in touch with her again. She didn't answer, so I didn't see her again for decades. And from 1982, when I left Houston, until 2018, October 2018. And I saw her again October I think it was October 24th, 2018, on a Thursday. By an amazing coincidence, how many years is that after that? Um, 25, 30 years, something like that. Uh, Dr. Pollard had seen her just a couple of days before I did, amazingly enough. And it was um, October 25th or so. We had an incredible reunion. I didn't know if she'd remember me. She was, Annie, Annie, oh my gosh. I'm I'm so proud of you. It was such a wonderful feeling. We had dinner together. We had an amazing visit. And I was going to give a poetry reading on Monday. And she said she wanted to come. I was so honored she would be at my poetry reading right around Halloween time, my birthday. And I was going to do a mem memorial, kind of a ritual for the dead as part of my poetry reading. She said, I'll be there. And that was Thursday night. And she died. Saturday morning. She had had health issues, but she seemed okay. She was gone. Uh, it was an incredibly powerful experience to have someone like that die just after we had reconnected. And we also talked about her influence on me and how she was a witch, and we didn't really talk about it at the time, but. I became a witch as well, and we shared that, and we had this powerful sense of connecting. So when, when she passed before, before I could see her, I felt something new, and then amazingly, my, my sister also passed like the same, within a day. So I had these two incredibly powerful women um, right behind me, and I felt their energy pushing me forward after that. I felt as if whatever I needed to do in the world, they were, and a friend um, who comes from the Curadera tradition in Mexico said the same thing. She said, uh, now they're on the other side, they're helping me, they're, they're moving me forward. I feel them on my back like the wind and the sail. And this is my poem for Zaki. It's called My Lioness Teacher. 
Francis Aki Shange, October 18th, 1948 to October 27th, 2018. And you'll see the phrase uh, come, came with her own things. Her birth name was Paulette, um, was it Marshall? I can't quite remember. Um, but she took the name Entezaki Shange uh, as an adult, and Entezaki means she who comes with her own things, and Shange means lion. My lioness teacher. You came with your own things, dear moon loving speaker. Your courage's dance flew behind you in yeses. You came with your own things, O oh honey eyed preacher, your definite heart raising dreams beyond wishes. You came with your own things, such strong ways to meet her. Your queen's independence, your peace beyond riches. You came with your own things, my lioness teacher. Your battles draped over your body like kisses. You came with your own things, heartbeat sister, reacher, still linking your loving, your sisters, your witches. So my next book is going to be a book of love poems. I'm just going to read one small poem from that book. Uh, I'm just starting to work on it, really. See, it's very new. The Bed in the Storm. The house is a boat, the boat is rocked, the wind is howling like a knife. The knife of the wind has cut the cord, the boat is moving like a life. Your heart in my arms, my life in your heart, at last, at night, at last, again. As if a night could move a life from strength to pain and back again. As if a world of anguish fed its nights through raindrops like a storm, threading them till at last the wind that generations made to howl had quieted and turns its head shaggy and peaceful for a while. And I'm going to close with a poem that I wrote for you all today, this morning, on my way here. It's called Poetry. Poetry turns the green fields into gold-leafed trees. It turns the copper into bronze. Poetry turns the never into once. It turns the once at once to something old. Poetry turns the terrified to bold, the full to empty, sleeping to a dance. Nothing escapes it when it's free to pounce. And yet, the soul of poetry is wild and has no home, no love, no peace, no care. How can it? It is open anywhere we find it. Bride of quietness's child, gift of the lost, unclaimed, questioned, exiled. So for all of you poets here, a final blessing. Blessing on the poets. Patient earth diggers, impatient fire makers, 
hungry word takers and roving sound lovers, sharers and savers, musers and acres, time keepers, time haters, wake sleepers, sleep wakers. May language's language, the silence that moves under each word, move you over and over, turning you wondering back to surprise. So happy we were able to share it with our community of poets and the Poetry Center. Um, it's, I'm kind of <laughs> speechless here, um, but I do have some things to say. I'm just you know, very grateful. And it's so funny how we did share that moment with the Antozaki Shanti. You know, at the beginning of that week, I had given a Reiki on the street <laughs> in Newark, and, uh, and, and you and me had dinner with her at the end of that week. Um, before we end this event um, with our book signing, and we do have some books to sell, but um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank IWCU Poetry Center crew and the associated administrative teams and councils that support our programming. I want to start with my team at the College of Arts and Humanities, our Poetry Center intern, Dana Troutman, and Ashley Harper, who's our student outreach intern for the Irish and Spencer Awards. Um, Cindy Pilla, the, the Poetry Center's administrative liaison, handles all the intricate details that go into making these events go smoothly. I'm grateful for the encouragement of Senior Associate Dean of College of Arts, of Arts and Humanities, um, K.H. Mune, and the support of the current Dean, Jen Bacon. The Poetry Center is supported by two very important councils, the Faculty Advisory Council, uh, co-chaired by myself and my colleague in English, Nancy Pearson, and whose membership includes Daniela Johannes, Megan Stradley, Lisa Conningsberg, Kate Stewart, Maureen McVeigh Trainer, Martin Delago, Sophia Vilsius, um, as well as the Poetry Center Advisory Council, chaired by Keen Spencer, who is with us this evening, I think. Um, Maureen, back there? Yeah, hi. Um, at, whose membership includes Senior Associate Dean Yoon, Kyle Spencer, Catherine Gilbert, who's back in the corner, um, oh, and Nancy's here in the front, um, Chris Boat Hennessy, Nina Espala, George Wright Mallor, um, and Marie McVeigh Trainer, and Kate Wickersham, um, uh, and, uh, and was our liaison from the WCU Foundation. Um, David Urbani, uh, Director of the Bookstore, has been a tremendous resource, and my colleagues in the Department of English, especially the Chair, Erin Hurt, and our Administrator, Sarah Paylor, as well as the Director of Graduate Studies, Dr. Omar Shefflin, have been very helpful when it comes to promoting our program, and we're very grateful. We invite you to join us for our future Fall uh, 2021 Poetry Center programs. Annalena Phillips Bell, the editor of Echo Tone, is the keynote speaker and featured reader for our virtual poetry teaching poetry conference, a gathering that will now shift from the spring semester to the fall and be held from November 11th to the 13th. Um, and in March 2022, our spring reader will be the award winning poet Anna Maria Hong. And certain, last but certainly not least, in April 2022, Cornelius Eady will be the keynote speaker for our Craft Fest, WCU's Poetry and Creative Arts Festival. His band, the Cornelius Eady Trio, will be our featured performers. We hope that you'll join us for our virtual and in person programs. Thank you, and please join us. Um, for conversation um, and for purchases and signing, signing in the back of the room. Thank you very much. Did anyone have any questions for Dr. Finch? I don't, I don't know if anyone did. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to ask? Did 
anybody have like if your teachers make you write questions, you have a question to take. <laughs> need to ask or get extra credit or anything like that. Yeah. We don't want to stop the extra credit opportunity. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> um, in terms of connecting your writing to being a witch, how do you find it connecting? That's a great question. How do I find my writing connecting with being a witch? That is, um, at this point, I feel that there is no difference. And I've kind of come back to the beginning that way. Because when I first started writing, it was because the words were magic. Because the incantation, the repetition of words hypnotized me. It really transported me like nothing else. And there was a long time in my life where I thought they were separate. And when I stopped my tenure at university teaching, I, for a while, I actually started two online communities. One was called American Witch, and the other was called Poet Craft Circles. And they each had their own magazine, their own community, and their own marketplace. <laughs> so I had six websites going because I couldn't imagine that the witches and the poets would have anything to talk to each other about and that they might inhabit the same uh, space. So that was about 10 years ago. So it's just in the last, over the last probably um, six years or so that I began to understand that they were the same thing for me. And so I needed to be public about that and just make that my life work. So I renamed myself Poetry Witch, and I started Poetry Witch Community, which is poets and witches. And it's amazing. It's like so easy. And I've discovered I'm not the only one, that a lot of the poets are witches, and a lot of the witches are poets, or you know, witch curious or poetry curious. Like it's sort of the same thing. And then when you think about it, you know, in, in cultures all around the world, you think about the shamans, the medicine men, the healers, the medicine women, uh, the, the, the bards in ancient Celtic, or the uh, griots in Africa. I mean, that in all cultures, pretty much around the world, it seems there are people who are poets who are also witches. You know, they, they do magic, they heal, they move between the worlds, and I believe this is not a coincidence. I believe it's because poetry actually is a magic tool. And maybe some of you happen to figure out that I am interested and excited about meter. <laughs> maybe you heard about something about that today. Well, to me, that meter is the special magic tool that really makes the intersection between poetry and magic happen. And that, that makes the poets have the power that they do so that poets are so respected and you know even in our in our, in our culture now even though um, you know a lot of people don't care about poetry much they say you know of course a lot of people do uh, but people use the word poet to mean something special like they'll say oh that was a very poetic film or that person is a poet of the basketball court you know they really use poetry to mean a special kind of artistry and you might wonder why. What's so special about poetry that, you know, how come you don't say he's the painter of the basketball court or she's the painter of the basketball court or they, they are the painter of the basketball court? You say they're the poet of the basketball, basketball court. What is it about poetry that's so special? Well, I think it is actually meter that it takes, like, the way we think, like our most dangerous part of ourselves, and it turns it into something physical and spiritual and magical. That, that is such a powerful thing to do that poets have become central in many cultures and it's the, the kind of power that I consider to be a witch's power as well. So to me it's completely the same now and uh, as a witch I care about the divine feminine. To me that's you know the goddess, the muse is the goddess, the goddess is the muse. I don't have a distinction at all anymore. So everything that I write is even if it's not explicitly um, witchy or spiritual, it's still doing that work of transformation, healing, and um, getting our world closer to the world of, um, of, of magic. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question?
extra credit or otherwise. I guess fall. I was born on Halloween, and um, I've written a lot of poems about fall. I actually have an essay online called The Poetry of Autumn, and it's published in the Poetry Foundation. They gave it the headline, Forget Spring, Fall's the Season for Poetry. <laughs> so I, I guess that's probably the season that for me is most resonant. Um, I do love them all, and as a, as a witch, I honor the seasons of the year in the old ancient agricultural cycles, you know, so um, I actually, in my Poetry Witch community, poetrywitch.com, if anyone's curious, um, I do rituals for all of the, it's called the Wheel of the Year, it's eight different markers, the solstices and the equinoxes, and then the days in between, halfway between the solstices and equinoxes, so it adds up to eight. So they're all really special and really amazing. But yeah, I guess being born on on Sally and Halloween makes that one my favorite. And it is the witch's new year, so it's a, a pretty important time for witches anyway. This might be kind of personal, but um, how did the craft find you? How, how did the craft, craft find me? Yeah, how did the craft find you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm writing a memoir now that's going to talk about that too. Um, I mean, I guess they found me kind of from childhood, but I didn't recognize it, especially when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet, and there weren't no books and stuff yet. Before like the 70s or 80s, there just wasn't much writing, any writing about it that I knew. My father actually was an expert in philosophy and world religions. He had a library of 40,000 books, and a lot of them were about world religions. Many, many religions. There was, as far as I know, nothing about goddesses or witchcraft in that whole library. So I didn't know until um, I was in, living in San Francisco and I was living in North Beach near this wonderful uh, bookstore called City Lights Books, uh, where Allen Ginsberg and all those people were published, and that whole um, San Francisco school of poetry. And they had, I got invited to read a poem, for, to perform my poetry at this reading outside of City Lights Bookstore. So I walked over there because I was living nearby and I um, recited my poem. It was called Eve. I recited it by heart. It's in, you can find it in my book Spells or in my Goddess Poems, which is going to be for sale in the back. It's a little book I published it myself. It only cost $9. So. If you want it, it's a great deal. Um, but anyway, in there are a lot of some poems about goddesses, and one of them is Eve, because I consider Eve a goddess. So I recited that poem, Eve, um, when Mother Eve took the first apple down from the tree that grew where nature's heart had been, and came tumbling, circling rosy into sin, which goddesses were lost and which were found. That was the beginning of it. So I recited that poem. And there was this incredible woman standing there um, wearing this black leather jacket, this very like powerful woman. And it turned out her name was Francesca Duby. She was actually the poet Norman Duby's um, ex-wife. Anyway, she was a witch, like an owl witch. And I had just moved to San Francisco and I really didn't know there was such a thing as a witch. But she came right up to me and she's like, I really like that poem. I think you're a witch. Do you want to come to my next circle at my house? So I said, sure. And I came to her house and she had this wonderful circle of witches celebrating. It was Lamas, the Harvest Festival, August. And so I went to the Lamas Festival. I like checked it out. I saw like the singing, the nature, the you know, the, the, just the whole the whole way of approaching spirituality, and I just was like, okay, well, this is what I am. Like now, I finally understand what I am. I'm much. So I never looked back. That was about 1990, and I kept it quiet for probably 20 years because I was teaching at public universities, and um, I didn't know witches and. 
I left California, <laughs> I lived in the Midwest, I was teaching there, so I kept it quiet. But um, my parents, I mentioned my father had this huge library, I told them about this and they started investigating it too, because they were really into spirituality and religion. They started reading all these witchy books and goddess books and sharing them with me, so I got pretty into it. You know, we were um, teaching each other about it. I read uh, Merlin Stone's amazing book, When God Was a Woman, such a great book. Uh, that really explains the connection of witchcraft to goddess religion. It's kind of, you know, the ancient matriarchal cultures. And so I, I built a whole awareness of it. And then finally in 2010, I couldn't hold it secret anymore. I started a blog called American Witch, and I started posting as a witch. So that was my journey. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Fun questions. Anybody else? Um, I was wondering about the owl poem that you wrote because you know that well and you said to think that the owl is the bird. Yeah. Well, yeah. so, do you mind talking more about that? I just think that's an interesting. Yeah, the owl, right. <laughs> I mean, the owl has such important symbolism because it hunts at night and everything. But it started in San Francisco, actually, also. Um, I had a, so I had a baby in 1990, right, right after I finished my PhD, and I had a postpartum break, which was like connected to flashbacks. And it was like this intense, difficult experience that I had, which kind of threw me into a healing path which got me deeper into the witchcraft tradition. Long story short, I was working with a shaman during that time, and the shaman did a journey to find my power animal, and it was, <laughs> So that was when I really began to get deeply into owl, and um, you know, as with shamanic work, you dance the animal, you really get, uh, you inhabit the animal, and I just got, so connected with the owl. And then when I left the university and I had those six websites going for a while, and I got into, I was trying to figure out other ways than being a professor to kind of be a poet in the world and you know, make a living and have an impact. So I, uh, I got into this whole business idea that maybe I could do my business. And so I, it was, I had a tattoo that said American Witch was the name of my business. And then there was a time when I realized I had to reclaim myself as a poet, but in a new way. I couldn't go back to being a poet in the university like I had been before, which was kind of a hierarchical and maybe patriarchal kind of way of thinking about being a poet, but I had to become a poetry witch. I had to become, integrate my spirituality into my poetry and my feminism into my trying to fit into the boxes anymore of one or the other. Um, so at that point, I got this tattoo of this owl, and I called it my poetry witch owl. Like, this was my way of saying, okay, I'm bringing that poetry back in my life in a new way. So I think, you know, in a lot of cultures, the owl is associated with death and things like that, and a lot of cultures with wisdom. And it's the bird of Athena, who is a really important uh, goddess for me, uh, being the goddess of wisdom. And um, if you go back beyond, like the, if you go back to the earliest Athena, you know she she was closer to the very ancient original goddesses, who were much more powerful than the ones we hear about sitting up on Olympus, looking cute. You know, like those real goddesses were very, very powerful. They were like originally probably the ones that were really in charge. And so the owl dates from that time. It's a way of, I think, you know, connecting death and life and uh, darkness and light that the owl stra straddles worlds the way that poetry does, uh, the unconscious and the conscious, and is able to kind of fly and float between those. And that's I guess my sensibilities. I'm always trying to go to the edges of whatever needs to be brought in, whatever is being repressed, and the owl helps me to do that. Anything else? A quick question, maybe one more? 
Everybody's good? I'm always excited to talk about shamanism and spirit energy and owls and <laughs> moving between worlds. And it's always so wonderful. Let's thank Dr. Finch again for sharing. <laughs> Um, both, uh, well, to be it all, right? To do it all. Poet, be a witch. <laughs> yeah, be a poetry witch. I was going to say, witches write spells. Like, spells are poetry. That's what it is. When you look at them, you look at one of the, you know, right. the casting books. It's really, yeah. you know? These, so, what you have is about transformation, right? right? Yeah. yeah. That's what Peter poetry. does. It transforms, transforms language into yeah. something different. Yeah, it does. And mm -hmm. so we're just so grateful. We do have some books in the back if you're interested in buying Exalt this Exaltation of Goddesses is there. Yeah. And uh, Goddess Poems, Goddess which is all my books. Is there. And by the way, if you get any of my books, in case I forget to remind you, read them aloud, read them aloud, read them aloud. These poems are mentioned and read aloud, hopefully three times. <laughs>